in Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. I, I wonder, uh, do any of you like to explore? See a couple people raising their, or nodding their heads or raising their hands. Uh, I, like, I like to explore. We like to explore as a family. We like to go and hike in the woods in the summertime. Uh, where we live right now in Fairboat, there's a, uh, a big nature center. And we like to go out there and we go hiking and we explore. And uh, when you go out exploring, chances are you're going to make some discoveries. And some discoveries are larger. Some discoveries are smaller. Uh, we like to go camping. We have a little pop-up camper. And uh, last summer, we haven't gone out yet. Well, we did go out once this summer, uh, and it snowed. <laughs> um, that, that was uh, end of middle of April, somewhere like that. Yeah, mid-April. Anyways, we like to go out in our pop-up camper, and we like to explore uh, campgrounds. And our, our tradition is kind of we go in, we get camp set up, and we get our pop-up camper all ready to go. And then we like to explore. We like to go see what there is to see. We want to find out, is there a beach uh, next to the lake that you can go swimming on? Is there a good fishing spot? Uh, those types of things. And sometimes we make uh, great discoveries, like we find a, a trail that no one knew about or you know some area behind a waterfall or on top of a bluff. Uh, sometimes we make some less than stellar discoveries, like they only have pit toilets and no showers or anything like that. Uh, but, but we like to explore. We enjoy going and seeing what, what's there. I, I wonder, have you ever made a, a more larger or significant type of discovery? Maybe or perhaps you've been exploring and you've been swimming in a lake or wading in a creek and you found a, a precious stone that you, you kept and you saved. Maybe even you've been, been out hiking and you, you've found a spot where some birds are nesting. Or maybe some animals have been uh, spending the night. And it's kind of a, a cool place to explore. Uh, maybe you're, you're a fisherman or woman and you found a, a secret honey hole that no one knows about. And you can just go there and uh, fish all day till your arms get tired and uh, that, that sort of thing. We make discoveries. And the one thing I've, I've, I've realized about discoveries is that the greater the discovery you make, the more of an impact it has on you as the discoverer. If you were to make a large type of discovery, maybe you found oil on your land, like the, the Beverly Hillbillies, or maybe uh, you, know, you struck it rich in the California gold rush, that, that type of discovery. It would have a, a very large impact on your life, would it not? And as we come to our text this morning in Romans chapter 4, we meet a man who made a discovery of his own, a, a great discovery. You could even maybe call him an explorer of sorts, a spiritual explorer who sojourned the life of faith, and he came out completely changed on the other side. As we open up this text this morning, the Apostle Paul, the author of our passage, he introduces us to this man and the discovery that he made and how it went on to change his life forever. And it's such a great discovery that this individual makes that it not only changes his life, but we, in reading and learning of his discovery, it changes our lives as well. And so as we unpack this text this morning, we're, we're invited to come along on this exploration of sorts and make this same discovery that this man in our text made in his spiritual life and allow this discovery to change our lives as well. So who is this man that we're introduced to in this text? Well, I'm sure you're familiar with him. This man is the man Abraham. And what is the great discovery that Abraham made in our text the discovery that Abraham made is the discovery of God's grace. And Abraham discovered the grace of God in his spiritual life, and it totally altered his life forever. And so as we examine Romans chapter 4, first eight verses this morning, Romans 4, 1 through 8, there's one big idea, our main theme I want you to remember and take away this morning. In fact, if this is all you, you can handle this morning, that's okay. I hope you'll take more, but if this is all you can take, remember this. 
Discovering the grace of God in salvation changes our lives forever. Discovering the grace of God in salvation, our discovery of the grace of God changes our lives forever. So let's read. You can follow with me in your copy of Scriptures, Romans chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. Paul writes this, Therefore, what shall we conclude? Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found. For if Abraham was justified out of works, he has the reason for boasting, but not towards God. But what does the scripture say? For Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. But the one who works his wage is not counted according to grace, but according to what is due. But to the one not working, but believing, and the one who is justifying the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Just as David says, how blessed is the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are the ones whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered up. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Our discovery of the grace of God and salvation changes our lives or ought to change our lives forever. And as we come to this text this morning, I'd like to ask the question, how does this happen? How does my discovery of God's grace How does it change my life forever? Our text gives us the answer to this question from the example of Abraham today. I'd like to show three tangible effects that God's grace and salvation has on our lives. So let's look at our text this morning. First tangible effect of God's grace in our lives is discovering God's grace helps us to think rightly about our efforts. Discovering God's grace helps us to think rightly about our efforts, our human efforts, our works. Now, boys and girls, if you're following along in the children's worksheets, you can draw someone trying to work for their own salvation. I just drew some people who are maybe working in the church, whatever they're doing, maybe they're out raking the lawn. But our text addresses our our works, our efforts, and whether they are or not uh, a part of our salvation. And we find this discussion here in the first two verses. You can see it in your text of Scripture. Uh, Paul says, Therefore, what shall we conclude? Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, has found. For if Abraham was justified out of works, he would have reason for boasting. Now, before we move on in our text here, I think it's important that we understand the the background, the context of our passage here, that we can follow the the flow of logic. Because if you recognize, if you understand the book of Romans, it's a very logical book. There's there's some flow here. And it's interesting that chapter 4 of Romans is built off of chapter 3 where Paul concludes, and we'll look at it a little bit later, in the end of chapter 3, that there is no room for boasting because salvation is by faith. And Paul continues, he carries over this discussion in chapter 4. In fact, if you ask me, it's probably a poor place for a chapter division because he builds his whole discussion on chapter 4 off of the very end of chapter 3. It's an expansion, and he makes a few claims to prove what he said in the end of chapter 3. In verses 1 through 8, that's our text for this morning, Paul claims that Abraham's right standing before God is entirely an act of grace. In verses 9 through 12 of chapter 4, he claims that Abraham's right standing before God took place before his physical circumcision, enabling him to be the father of both Jews and Gentiles. And then in verses 13 through 22, he claims that through faith, Abraham is the spiritual father of both Jews and Gentiles. That's the argument Paul's making. All this goes back to the very end of chapter 3. So, the first two verses of our text in chapter 4 are all about the question of what brings about salvation. Now, that's an important question, isn't it? And if you went around to all the churches in Sauk Center or Melrose, or, you know, just, you know, draw a 35, 40 minute radius, you went around to all the churches and asked that question, what brings about salvation? You're going to get some different answers, right? That's what Paul's addressing here. What, what brings about salvation? Is it works, or is it a matter of faith? 
And Paul writes so that we can understand our role in our salvation. Notice with me from our text this morning that our efforts may produce human boasting. Paul talks about this discovery that Abraham makes. Look at it in the text. For if Abraham was justified out of works, he has reason for boasting. I mean, that's really the question, isn't it? Are there any works that can bring about salvation? And here we come face to face with the the reality of our own human existence, our falling condition, if you will, that we want to do things on our own, don't we? We do. Shake your heads, yes. We want to do life on our own. We don't like to rely on other people. After all, we are, we are Americans, we live in the United States, we idolize rugged individualism, the pull yourself up by your bootstraps mentality that populated the West, our very own manifest destiny. And Paul asks the question in our text in regards to our salvation, what should we conclude Abraham has found? Remember, we talked about discoveries, right? And Abraham's making this discovery. What discovery did Abraham make? in his own spiritual exploration. Well, he gives it to us here, the first half of the answer. If he was justified by works, he would have reason for boasting. Now, it's important for us to understand this word justification. I don't want to just throw around these these churchy terms that maybe if you're new here that you've never heard, uh, heard the word before. So let's get a definition of justification. Justification is a legal act in which God declares a guilty sinner not guilty. Uh, And the important part is that this is a legal act. It refers to our standing before God. Some have described it as just as if I had never sinned. It's a sinner being made right with God because our punishment was paid by Jesus Christ. That's what we mean when we use that word. And Paul says if this whole process of justification, if it happened by works then Abraham, and by extent anyone, any of us, we would have reason to boast. Now that might sound attractive to you. Because we might like that idea of saying, I can do it myself. I don't need anybody. I can lift me up and say, I accomplished this on my own. There is a sense of human boasting, but it's important here. Remember I said chapter 4 is built off of chapter 3. It's important to connect this because in verse 27 of chapter 3, Paul says, you can see it in your text of scriptures, where is the boasting? It has been excluded. So Paul says in chapter 3, you can't boast. So if you're following along here, you might wonder, wait, wait a minute, what's going on? First Paul says you can't boast. Now Paul says you can boast. Is he contradicting himself? I don't think so, because he gives one very important qualifier. Four simple words in the end of our text there. Notice it in your copy of the scriptures. He says, but not towards God. But not towards God. Paul teaches that our efforts, our human efforts, may produce human boasting, but they always reveal human brokenness. Sure, we may boast if we were justified by our own works. We may say, this is me. This is something that I did on my own. But from God's perspective, we have no cause for boasting. Our boasting, our works, gain us nothing with God. That's what Paul says here. And here we encounter another significant doctrine, the doctrine that we would call total depravity. That there's nothing good with inside Men, don't let people tell you that man is basically good. We might make a few mistakes that we have to, you know, work out. It's not in the Bible. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12 tells us that there is no one righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.23 reminds us that all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Try as we may, our good works could never Gain us a right standing before God. And we may try to boast in our own abilities. I did this or I did that or this is something that I produced. But from God's perspective, Paul reminds us, not before God. From God's perspective, they are nothing. 
And this points us to our greatest need, doesn't it? Our greatest need is something outside of ourselves. We have no good in and of ourselves to offer to God, and so we need his help. And even if if salvation could be earned, the fact of the matter is we would not be good enough to earn it. This is why we need to run to Jesus. This is why we need to run to Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you've been trusting your own works to bring about salvation. You've been trying to uh, work through your discovery of salvation this first way, this justification by works way, boasting in my own merits way. Paul reminds us we have nothing to offer God. We could never have enough good works to boast before him. And so rather than trying, we just need to run to him. We need to run to him in faith and repentance for our sins and trust the work of Jesus. And if you are here today or maybe you're watching online and you've never done that, you can do that today. Now maybe you're here today and you're a believer. You have turned to God in in faith and repentance, but you're still trying to do your spiritual life on your own. You're still trying to earn God's favor by your good works. You're still trying to fill your spiritual bank account with good works in hopes that you will gain a better standing before God. We call this legalism. What is legalism? There's a lot of talk about legalism today. Legalism isn't about standards or rules or things like that, though though it might have some overlap there. Here's how I... Think of legalism. Legalism as its base, let me just say, that's a distorted view. Because God could never love you more than he does right now. There's nothing you could do that would somehow earn more of God's love because you already have it. I don't know about you, but for me, that's that's a big relief. Because sometimes we get into that mode of, man, I have to do, 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 do. And we forget that it's already been done. And so if you've been caught in that cycle of trying to do to earn God's love, Paul reminds us the reality of this thing called justification. You don't have to do it. It's already been done. And Paul reminds us that discovering this aspect of God's grace helps us. It changes us. It helps us to think rightly about our efforts. If we go back to our text and we transition to verse 3, we find the the second tangible effect of our discovery of God's grace. It helps us to think rightly about our faith. Helps us think rightly about our faith. And after Paul uh, uses this example of Abraham talking about our efforts, he transitions to talk about Abraham's faith, and I think by extension, our faith. Now, boys and girls, if you're following along, you can draw a picture of a Bible character who had faith. I just drew Elijah. Remember, Elijah was praying to God, asking God to send down the fire from heaven on the altar, and and God did that for him. He had faith. And look in our text at verse 3 with me. Paul says, what does Scripture say? For Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Paul points us back here. There's an Old Testament reference to Genesis 15, verse 6, the description of Abraham's faith. He believed God. It was credited for righteousness. Here we see the heart of the biblical message that we can't trust ourselves for salvation. We need faith. But what is faith? What is faith? What does it mean to have biblical, Bible-based faith? I think the writer of Hebrews answers this for us in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. He says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is certainty amidst something that you're hoping for. It's proof of things that you haven't even seen them happen yet. The reality of our spiritual life is that some things just have to be taken by faith. And that's both encouraging but also difficult some things have to be taken by faith and our passage is all about this notice what paul talks about when he talks about faith he says our faith demands a definite object you know we hear a lot of talk about faith in our world today don't we 
We hear a lot of people who say that they are, well, I'm a real spiritual person. You ever hear that? What does that even mean? We have people who, when difficulty happens, difficult life circumstances, they say, well, I have faith. I think a good response to that is faith in what? It's good that you have faith, but what is the source of your faith? For them, their faith is often little more than positive thinking. I have faith. I trust something that this is all going to work out. But faith demands an object, and so the logical question is, what is the source or the foundation of this faith you say you have? Other people in our world today, they have faith in something, but they have faith in the wrong things. They have faith in their job to pay the bills. They have faith in the stock market to fund their retirement. They have faith in uh, their own hard work and effort to provide a life of, of means and maybe ease and get all the toys they want in life. Our text this morning tells us that our faith demands a definite object. Faith does have to be in someone or something. And Paul tells us in our text this morning, using the example of Abraham, where our faith should be founded. Look at what he says, very simply. Abraham believed God. He believed God. God is the only sufficient foundation for our faith. Abraham made this discovery, and it's a discovery that Paul calls us to make as well. Our faith demands a definite object, but notice, continuing in our text, our faith provokes a divine response. Paul gives a second description, and he tells us that our faith does something. When we believe in God, it evokes a response from him. Look at what he says. Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him for righteousness. Think about that for a moment. God responds to the faith of his children. When we make the discovery that Abraham made, that that our self-righteous deeds gain us nothing before God, and we come to the end of ourselves, and we put our faith in the only sure foundation, God responds. What a blessing. Our faith is counted as righteousness. Now the word Paul uses here, I want to talk about this for a moment, the word Paul uses is very significant, and you'll pardon me if I geek out on you for a moment, but uh, the Greek word used here is a word that literally means to count or to reckon or to credit. It's actually, actually a mathematical accounting term. Any, any accountants here? Anyone? No accountants? Well, if you were an accountant, I'd say this is for you. Uh, it's an, account, an accounting term. You, you ever balance your checkbook? I'm sure you have. I, I hate balancing a checkbook personally. <laughs> but you have to do it on a regular basis. I'm thankful my wife does most of that. But you have to do it. Make sure you have everything in the right accounts, and line items, and everything matches up. This is the term Paul uses here in our text. For counted to him for righteousness. It's literally make sure there is enough in the account. Now remember, we can never work to achieve our salvation. We, we can never be that righteous to be able to do that, even if it were possible. So we needed help. We needed someone who could be totally and completely righteous on our behalf. That person you know is Jesus Christ. And without Jesus, God the Father would look at our spiritual bank account and say, it's lacking, it's empty, it's overdrawn. But when we put our faith in Jesus... And we run to God, the only sufficient foundation for our faith. Our faith is counted as righteousness. And now our spiritual bank account has the righteousness of Jesus credited to our account. You see the the, uh, accounting terms there. And what an incredibly amazing process this is. But the point Paul's making in our text is that when we put our faith in Jesus, something happens. Amen? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Yeah. Something happens. And we're not left to wonder, will my faith do anything? Does my faith even make a difference? Paul says it does. God puts righteousness in the spiritual bank account of those who put their faith in him. 
Now, maybe you're here today and you haven't been putting your faith in Jesus, the sure foundation of faith. Maybe you'll come upon this message online somewhere and you've been trusting in other things, maybe yourself, maybe your own human efforts. Paul teaches us if that's where we're at, we're going to come up short. Our account will be overdrawn. And so we need to make the discovery that Abraham made. Put your faith in God. He will credit it for righteousness. You know, even as believers, sometimes we get our faith a little mixed up. We have trouble trusting God as our sure foundation of life. We want to do things on our own. We want to follow things on our own. Perhaps we want to trust ourselves. Maybe we wonder, well, does God really do anything? Can I trust God? He's been silent for a while. I've been asking him to do something. Maybe you even wonder, does my faith even work? And if you've been calling out to God as a believer, maybe you've been asking him to do something and it hasn't turned out as you wanted, let me just encourage you, you will never regret putting your faith in God. Because he is the only source of foundation for your faith. And even though you can't see him or you, you don't know how he is working, he is doing something and he is doing something great in your life even today. Paul reminds us from our text, our discovery of the grace of God and salvation, it changes our lives forever. Discovering the grace of God helps us think rightly about our efforts. It helps us think rightly about our faith. And as we come to the end of our text, discovering the grace of God in salvation helps us think rightly about our standing. Helps us think rightly about our standing before God. Boys and girls, if you're following along in the children's worksheets, you can draw someone who has a right standing before God. I just drew someone with a clean heart. Their heart's clean because they know that they are right before God. Look at verse 4 in our text. The one who works, his wage is not counted according to grace, but according to what is due. Paul talks about our standing before God, and he teaches us two truths about our standing. First of all, our standing is wholly undeserved. It's wholly undeserved. And this would be the logical ramification, right? If we can't earn it, if we can't work for it, then it must be undeserved. And he gives us this contrast in the text between the one who works and the one who doesn't. And we, we understand this in our world today because we have a society in which you work and you, you earn a wage. You go to work and you, you have you know, an agreement with your employer. You'll, get, you'll make this much an hour or you'll get this much for a week of, of work. And when you do that, that is a wage, right? It's something you earn. It's not a gift. And Paul says in our text here that the one who, for the one who works... His wage is not counted as a gift. It's not counted according to grace, but according to what is due. If you work and you get paid a wage, you earn that wage. It makes sense. And Paul uses a scenario to teach that our standing in Christ as a result of our salvation is completely undeserved. It's not something we earn. Now remember, he just talked about that in the first few verses. If you could earn salvation... We would have reason to boast, but not before God, but, but you can't, so we don't have reason to boast. We don't work for our salvation. We don't work to receive a rage. It is completely undeserved. Notice Paul says it is not an act of grace. Many translations here say use the word gift or favor. It's not a gift. It's actually the word for, for grace, the, the Greek word uh, used for grace throughout the New Testament, charis. Uh, maybe you know someone named charis. Uh, that, that, that's a Greek word. It means grace. I knew, used to know someone named charis. Paul, Paul, it's as if Paul's making a contrast here between something that is not by grace and something that is by grace. Something that is earned and something that is a gift or favor. Because look at what he says in verse 5. To the one not working but believing the one justifying the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Here he talks about the one not working. And he told us that our standing based on that is wholly undeserved. But we continue in our text. We find that it's undoubtedly secured. 
and secure. Nothing can take that away. And notice the certainty here. This is just what happens. This is the natural result of putting your faith in God. You have a secure standing. Why? Because it's not based on me. It's not based on something that I had to earn because I could never earn it anyways because my faith is in the right place. It's based on God, the one justifying the ungodly. Sorry to geek out on you again, but I find it so interesting here. The, the word uh, Paul uses here in the Greek New Testament, it's a, the word for justify. It's a present participle. It expresses perhaps a simple action, maybe with a continuous aspect. And so when I, when I read it and when I translated it, I just translated it as, as God, the one justifying the ungodly, because there, there's some action in the word there. What does that mean? The one justifying the ungodly. I I think it simply means this is what he does. This is who he is. He is the one declaring the ungodly as righteous. That's what our God does. So what does this mean for us? Well, first of all, stop trying to do it on your own. Unbeliever, you've been working for your own salvation. Stop it. You can never do it anyways. It's a pointless effort. You have a better alternative. Commit your life to the one justifying the ungodly. For those of us who believe, I think it means we stop doubting God. We stop doubting him. If you've committed your life, your faith to this one, the one who's described here in our text as justifying the one who justifies the ungodly, this should give us assurance of salvation. Because sometimes we do struggle. Do we not? Sometimes we struggle. And maybe we have those days where we wake up and we say, I don't, I don't feel saved. I wonder, could God really love and accept me? Maybe for you, you've been caught in a cycle of, of sin. And you just can't see how God could offer you salvation. And you know you've repented, but every time you commit that sin, You struggle, am I really saved? Did I really mean it? Will God really save me? Maybe I didn't say the right words. Paul's message to you is, yes, God would really save you. And if Paul were here, I'd think he'd probably get a little firm with us and say, get over yourself because it's not based on you. It's based on him. Our standing in Christ is secure not because we've maintained it. We could never maintain it. In fact, I like what John MacArthur said about this passage. He said, if my salvation depended on me, I would lose it. Isn't that the truth? But it doesn't rely on us. If you're here today and you're caught in that cycle of doubt, Paul offers you hope. If you've placed your faith in the finished work of Jesus, your standing before him is eternally secure. There's nothing you can do that would take that away. And hear me on this, because not every church in this town believes that. Abraham made this discovery. It's a discovery that we can make, that Paul invites us to make. And our discovery of the grace of God and salvation changes our lives forever. But we have to go back, because there's two more verses in our text, and we have to close it all together here. We have a word from David regarding our standing in verses 7 and 8. Paul does something unique. He kind of switches metaphors here. Because he started talking about Abraham. And now he switches characters and he talks about David, the king of Israel. And he looks at the example of David from Psalm 32, verses 1 and 2. That's actually an Old Testament quote here. And he adds David's comment on our standing in Christ and the security that brings. Psalm, 31, or Psalm 32, 1 and 2 says, How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and whose spirit there is no deceit. And Paul adds to everything he said by giving the testimony of David. Our secure standing brings the joy of forgiveness. David talks about the lawless deeds have been forgiven. There's security there in our standing. He talks about the security of our salvation and our standing, bringing the joy of release. Paul says, blessed is the man whose sin will not take into account. It's just been released, let go. 
God doesn't hold our sins against us, but he made a way to take care of that. Forgiveness, release, undeserved and secure standing. What a great God we have. Paul reminds us, our discovery of the grace of God and salvation changes our lives. Changes how we think about our efforts, how we think about our faith, how we think about our standing. I don't know if you can remember, for some of you, maybe it's been a while, but you can remember the time, those of you who are married, when you were dating. Or maybe you have kids who are going through that dating process, or grandkids who are going through that process, and maybe you can remember that. There comes a point in every dating relationship where you have to have a, a DTR conversation. Anyone know what a DTR conversation is? Define the relationship. You have to define where you are now and where you see yourself going. This is often the time when maybe you sheepishly express your admiration for or affection for the other person. and You're hoping they will reciprocate. In our text today, Paul essentially has a define the relationship conversation. He seeks to define our relationship with God. And he lets us know where we are at in our relationship. He lets us know that our efforts can never earn God's love. He lets us know that we need faith in the love of God shown to us in Jesus Christ. And he lets us know that once we do that, we will have God's love forever. That's our relationship with Christ. And Paul expresses it clearly in our text through the example of this man, Abraham. Abraham made this spiritual discovery, and it's a discovery that we can make as well. So what do we do about it? What do we do with a text like this? Let me just give you a couple next steps here for you this week. First of all, treasure what you've discovered. If you've shared in this discovery with Abraham, you've discovered the grace of God, take some time to celebrate that. Maybe you just need to get away this afternoon or sometime this week and take 10 or 15 minutes alone with the Lord and just, just praise him. Treasure what you've discovered. Embrace what others discovered. Maybe there's someone here in person or someone who's listening online and you, you, you hear this talk about Abraham, you hear the hope that even believers in our congregation have, but you, you haven't embraced that. You haven't accepted that for yourself. The challenge for you is to embrace the discovery of God's grace that others have made. Turn to Jesus today in repentance and faith, trusting in him alone for salvation. He is the one justifying the ungodly. Number three, share what you've discovered. Maybe the takeaway for you this morning is you need to tell someone. You need to tell someone. You've, you've learned about Abraham. You've made the discovery that he's made, but you, just, you struggle to uh, share that with someone else. It's hard. It's difficult. My challenge to you is maybe to find one person, even this week, that you can share your discovery of God's grace with them and point them to Jesus as well. And finally, help someone else. Help someone else in their discovery. Find someone that you can disciple, someone that you can mentor, someone that you can come alongside and, and help them grow in their knowledge of God. Maybe specifically you need to plan a practical way that you can do that this week. Send a text, give a phone call, invite them for coffee. But step into someone's life to further their discovery of the greatness of God and salvation. Our discovery of God's grace in salvation changes our lives forever. We've seen very clearly three tangible effects that this discovery has on us. It changes how we think about our efforts, our faith, and our standing. What an incredible passage. Imagine with me. What if everyone here today, what if Faith Baptist Church in Sauk Center, what if we lived this text this week? What would it look like? What might it look like for you? In your daily rhythm, and your work, what could God do through our church if we took a text like this and we lived it? Let's make it our goal this week to live out this text and to share and understand better our discovery of God's grace and salvation. Would you bow with me as we pray this morning? Father God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the opportunity to 
study it. Thank you for the opportunity to sing. And even as our worship team comes up, we prepare for uh, one final song. Father, we ask that you would use your word to challenge us, to help us, that we could be more like you. We ask that we would take the truth of your word and that we would apply it, that you would make us what we need to be so that we can honor and glorify you. Father, for those, if there's anyone here who has never made this discovery that Abraham has made, they've never trusted you for salvation, we ask that they would do that even today. They would not leave today or they would not turn off the TV if they're watching online without knowing for sure that they have faith in you and a relationship with you. Be with us today as we uh, depart and encourage our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.